I have the honor of introducing Travis County Judge Andy Brown and invite him to the stage to provide some closing remarks. I will read um, a bit of his bio, but the rest you can find in the Whova app. Judge Brown presides over the Travis County Commissioner's Court, which oversees the county's $1.4 billion annual budget, acts as the county's chief administrator and is director of emergency management for the county. Since taking office, Judge Brown has significantly increased resources to historically underserved communities, including starting a mass COVID-19 vaccination effort prioritizing communities of color. And during winter storm Uri, Judge Brown um, helped direct resources to the hardest hit areas in Travis County. Um, I'm gonna stop there, but he has several more paragraphs of accomplishments available in the Whova app. I will also just highlight this one thing which I felt um, very called to highlight, which is the last line of his bio. So for my personal bio, I always leave in, no matter the um, audience, that um, Emily Ryder Perlmeter lives in Dallas with her husband, two kids, and cat. Judge Andy Brown lives in Austin with his wife, two kids, one dog, one cat, and four chickens. <laughs> Judge Brown. All right, thanks Emily. Um, my staff has decided to challenge me today by printing this on slightly smaller font than normal to save paper. So <laughs> here we go. Um, but good afternoon and a warm welcome to Austin for those of you who are from other places. Uh, hope that y'all stay through the weekend and get to see the eclipse on Monday. Um, but if you stay that long, make sure you don't go anywhere on Monday. Just stay put wherever you are Monday morning. Um, I want to thanks, thank Housing Works Austin, especially Awaz and Nora, for hosting us and for the invitation to share some thoughts as the Housing and Livable Community Summit comes to a close. And I guess I'm the last thing between y'all and, and walking out this door, so I will be efficient. Uh, despite my title of county judge, I think most of y'all are from Texas, you know this probably, but not an actual judge. Um, have the honor of being a part of the elected body that does policy making for the county, and then does emergen I do emergency management when needed, when eclipses come and other things like that. Um, I have the, it's, it's a whole lot of fun every day to set the policies for the county and get to see just what other things come to us each week on Tuesdays when we make those decisions. Um, and it's great to have opportunities like this summit where we can learn and talk about critical work that everybody is doing uh, in your communities to address the affordability crisis that's felt here in Travis County and across the state and the country. We know that addressing affordability is important, but it's not just about housing, especially here in Travis County. Our community will be safer, more resilient, and a more equitable, pla equitable place where everybody can thrive when people have access to safe, stable, and affordable housing. From the county's perspective, this also needs to include access to health care, transportation, food, good jobs, and other supports. We can do so much at the local level to address the confounding crisis of mental health, substance use, and affordability, and we've been busy at work on this intersection over the past three years at Travis County. Thanks in large part to the American Rescue Plan Act and President Biden, we've been able to make historic investments into building permanent supportive housing projects, overdose prevention programs, and launching our mental health diversion pilot program. It's no secret that our county jail is the largest mental health provider here in the county, which is completely unacceptable. We're living through one of the worst mental health crises in our lifetime here at home and across the country. Before COVID in our Travis County Jail, which today has about 2,200 or so, just under 2,300 people in it. Um, about 20, 21% of those people on the survey that we give people when they come into the jail said that they had a significant unmet mental health need. Today, that, by that same measure, it's the same measure, it's not a perfect one, but it is the same one we were using pre-COVID, that number is 44%. So it's doubled since COVID. And I think the real number is actually much higher than that for people who are in the jail who have unmet mental health needs. So that's why we are launching a mental health diversion pilot program while we plan and build a permanent mental health diversion center because our community needs these services now. Our community will, will be more safe, stable, and resilient when we provide mental health care and substance use disorder treatment for people outside of our jails and before they end up in our jails. Expanding mental health care access will help address the systemic health disparities that affect the most vulnerable and marginalized communities 
in Travis County. We need a government that works for everyone and creates opportunities for upward mobility, and that means equal access to mental health care, overdose prevention programs, permanent supportive housing, and good paying jobs. Drug overdoses are the number one cause of accidental death in Travis County. And that's one of the reasons we invested $860,000 over the next two years to provide Narcan kits and opioid remediation through peer recovery support, support programs and methadone services to community-based organizations on the ground for tackling the opioid epidemic. To date, Travis County has provided 3,814 boxes, which is almost 8,000 doses of Narcan nasal, sp nasal spray to community-based organizations who are on the front lines of providing Narcan to individuals at risk of opioid overdose. Our community needs better access to naloxone or Narcan, the life-saving drug used to reverse overdoses because every overdose death is preventable, and we need to do more there. We've also made significant strides addressing these public health crises, but the other piece of the puzzle is addressing the affordability, or what, might, what a lot of people might say is a livability crisis. The rising cost of rent, housing, transportation, and other essential goods and services impacts working families and those struggling just to get by here in Travis County. It's so important to work together with all the jurisdictions, the county, the city, the state, um, community organizations, and residents to develop effective solutions to affordability challenges for our most vulnerable. And so that's what we did. We got about $220 million from President Biden for the uh, Rescue Act, the ARPA funds. We immediately put $110 million of that into our supportive housing initiative pipeline, where we doubled down on our larger community goal to end homelessness and increase the supply of deeply affordable housing for vulnerable communities. We leveraged resources and expertise across federal, state, city, county, local nonprofits, private developers, and advocacy organizations to expand permanent supportive housing opportunities to provide long-term support for low-income Travis County residents like those experiencing homelessness and those experiencing homelessness. Community organizations like Mobile Loves and Fishes here in Travis County who are leading the way in how we care for our unhoused community members with the Community First Village is one great example. It's an incredible master plan community that provides affordable, permanent supportive housing in a community first oriented environment for people coming out of homelessness. Uh, when you go out to the neighborhood of tiny homes, um, you can see people who are working together to not only transition out of homelessness, but who care for their neighborhood and neighbors as any of us do. Earlier this year, we approved 35 million of that $110 million to add almost 650 more units to the community Community First Village and to continue the great work that they're doing. And that 35 million was just part of it. I think the Dell Foundation matched us immediately and others have also given to that. Um, just this Tuesday, we approved another $7 million to build 60 units of affordable housing with the SAFE Alliance. And Connor, are you in here? Where's Connor? That's, he was in here. I talked to him briefly outside, but he and, and others worked so hard to get that very complicated set of things together, but it worked. Funding from the city, fund, our funding from the county, and it's really absolutely amazing how they're able, able to provide uh, supportive housing for many, many years based on this one-time funding. Um, we're also setting an example of partnership across the county to build supportive housing and address this crisis head, head on. On top of supportive housing, we also made sure to address the rising costs of rent. When the COVID outbreak began, working families were feeling the brunt of rent hikes and the cost of goods. That's why we invested $30 million in rental assistance to stabilize tenants who are unable to make rent or other payments during this difficult time. It was critical that we combine this initiative with legal services for low-income tenants and provide emergency assistance to prevent evictions, which as we know in the height of the outbreak was a crisis affecting tens of thousands of our residents. The other key component to address affordability is access to reliable and sustainable transportation, and that's through passenger rail. We're seizing the moment with the once-in-a-lifetime investment from President Biden and the bipartisan infrastructure law to advance passenger rail in Texas and across the country. We're building a statewide coalition of support from our federal and state representatives to county judges, mayors, council members across the state to see how we can build a coalition to get passenger rail done as quickly as possible in Texas. And I'm excited to partner with my good friend and colleague in Bear County, Judge Peter Sakai, 
to advance passenger rail in our region and make it a little easier to watch our favorite pro basketball team, the Spurs, uh, instead of driving down I-35, hopefully taking a train there someday soon. Um, we started an advisory county council with rail experts across the state. We had our second meeting today, actually. Um, everyone from uh, Secretary Cisneros to folks from Governor Abbott's office to folks from TxDOT to uh, Jay Crossley, a real cross-section of, of, of rail advocates and people that like passenger rail, and we're trying to make it happen here in Texas. Um, there's so many exciting initiatives and policies that we've passed with the hard work of our incredible county team who's here today. And uh, I don't, did, I was just in a meeting with Peel. I see Nathan, there's Nathan. Let's give Nathan a hand, please. <laughs> Representing the Travis County Health and Human Services Department, uh, who is making all of this work. When we give them money, they actually make the things happen. So thank you very much. Um, I know many of you in this room are working to bring this dream to Americans all across the country. And we're so grateful for all the work that you're doing to make this a reality. And thank you, Housing Works, for hosting me today and allowing me to share some thoughts. So thank you all very much. Hope you had a good day today. Thank you.